say is, before we even get started, once we get into the, into the case, I just want y'all to let me get through the facts. That's all I'm saying. But just let me just get through the facts. But it's, it's going to be, I have a tasty morsel for y'all tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So let's get into this criminal law and procedure because this is something that could be of interest to business owners. Uh, and I do want to advise you of the soccer team if you want to participate in that. <clears throat> we may have one or two questions and the room will be uh, Prof. Blackmore. And so the online activity that you're going to do next week is going to be on the same in the same place. You'll go in there, you'll go into the room, and then there'll be a, uh, I think it's like 35 question, it's a questionnaire. And so this is where you're going to go in to do that. Question. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about criminal law. Okay. And so your book talks about this modern penal code. Now, let's just be clear about this. This is not like I know it sounds kind of very, you know, uh, important and all, and it is important, but it's not a law, okay? This is like a model adopted by the American Law Institute, and most states model their criminal laws based on the model penal code. So some of the statutes for burglary, these types of things, larceny, uh, uh, you know, these types of things are modeled each state off of the model penal code, but it might not be exactly as it is reflected in the model penal code. So this itself is not, the model penal code is not a law, so to speak. And so we'll talk about criminal law versus criminal procedure. Okay, and criminal law consists of a body of law that for the purpose of uh, preventing harm to society declares what conduct is criminal and prescribes the punishment to be imposed. This is the substantive criminal law. This is where the actual crime, the law that talks about <coughs> the crime of uh, burglary, uh, larceny, uh, whatever, assault, battery. The criminal law of that is going to come from the, what we call the substantive criminal law. And then now, when the time comes for the DA or the prosecutor to bring that criminal law case against the defendant, then that person is going to have to follow procedure that is prescribed by the court, the defendant's attorney and the prosecutor, which brings cases on behalf of the state, let's say, for example, the state of California versus John Doe, okay? When the uh, prosecutor or the district attorney uh, gets ready to do that, he, he or she has to follow certain criminal procedures in the exercise of bringing that to law by following certain criminal procedures regarding the criminal investigation, the arrest, the trial, the sentencing, all of these things have to follow proper procedure, okay? You can't just go over there without a warrant and go into the person's house and get evidence because then that is not following proper procedure. And then uh, this gives you a <coughs> a way to distinguish the criminal law versus the civil law. The civil laws that we talked about earlier, like negligence, those types of things. Civil laws are designed to compensate parties, money damages, so to speak. Like if somebody steals something from you, you can take them to court and get a judgment for money. Okay, on the other hand, if you press charges against that person for stealing something against you, then if the prosecutor, the DA, decides there is enough evidence, then he or she may bring a criminal case against that person for theft. At which time, 
that person will be adjudicated uh, for that crime and they may receive some type of punishment, jail time, probation. Uh, they may have to pay a fine. Or, but this is the difference between these types of, of laws, the criminal laws and the criminal. And most, I mean, most criminal laws don't come from a criminal statute that is based upon the model penal code. May not be exactly, but that's what those statutes are going to be. And then you have to have a burden of proof uh, that is different in a criminal case than it is in a civil case. In a civil case, like in that Martha Stewart case, one of her problems was that, they, that the prosecutor was trying to prosecute her based on a preponderance of the evidence standard, and the judge said, no, 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 this is a criminal case, and so you're gonna have to, you can't just, the proof that you have does not meet the standard. And so that is why the particular count, that like count nine, was overturned, because the a standard of proof that was used was not beyond a reason, uh, reasonable uh, doubt. A juror, based on that evidence that was provided, could have a, could have made another determination. It was not proof beyond a reasonable doubt, which is what you must have in a criminal case. Because a person can go to jail, can go to prison. And then uh, from a legal perspective, a crime has two parts, okay? Uh, our book tells us that it has, and I'm not to now not to use this color, it's hard to read, a physical part whereby the defendant committed an act or an omission, which is called uh, in the Latin, or what we call in the criminal vernacular, the actus reus. And then the mental part, focusing on the defendant's subjective state of mind, what we call the mens rea. So, and then we uh, distinguish more on this actus res. The act requirement requires the government to prove that the defendant's actions objectively satisfy the elements of that particular crime or offense. In other words, the actus res. And then the mental requirement, the mental element which translates literally into the guilty mind refers to the general requirement that the defendant have a requisite degree, degree of culpability with regard to each element of that crime, also called the mens rea. We talked about this before. Some people wanted to take the happy feet lady and send her to jail, but she did not have the intent, the intentional mens rea to cause the death of that child, it was an accident. And so here are some self defenses that a person could assert uh, if the prosecutor is uh, bringing a case against someone for <coughs> assault and battery, and that person could say, oh, <coughs> excuse me, I was acting in self defense. That could overcome those elements that are required for the actual battery or assault and battery. Or the person could say, you know, I was crazy. I didn't, I'm just mentally incapacitated. And then I guess sometimes some people can say, I did it under duress or intoxication. And then our books tells us that some of these crimes are classified in, in several different kinds of ways. We're gonna have our felonies and then we're gonna have our misdemeanors. Your felonies are really serious crimes uh, and they can carry incarceration for a year or more. Whereby your misdemeanors are crimes that carry up to a year of incarceration. And sometimes these are gonna be given probation or something like that or a fine. 
And here are some examples of some crimes. <clears throat> That your books, your book talks about fraud, Ponzi schemes, conspiracy, racketeering. We talked about insider trading, robbery, bribery, obstruction of justice, uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. These are just some examples of some crimes. Yes, ma'am. Um, so a misdemeanor often, even you said it, you can maybe pay to get out of like serving jail time. Say that again. Um, misdemeanor, you can sometimes pay the fee to get out of serving jail time. Mostly misdemeanors, uh, especially, I mean, especially if it's like the person's first time, the prosecutor is probably not going to, even if that crime has a penalty of uh, incarceration, rarely do they go for that. There's usually like probation. They usually look for probation. And then can you, I don't know, is there, can you ever pay to get out of a felony or? Uh, well, yeah, get a good lawyer. <laughs> because, because, see, you got to understand, the prosecutor's going to come in hard and strong. They're going to come in for the highest thing they come come in for. And then what we end up doing at the end of the day is we negotiate and meet somewhere down at a lower level crime. And so that's what attorneys are doing. You know, they'll want, want to bring you in for uh, some type of, uh, uh, let's say, a felony uh, assault and battery or something like that. Uh, it, and so then I could go in and maybe somehow get that down to some type of, a, you know, uh, I forget what you call it, but it's like this, this, this public disturb, disturbing the peace or something like that. Bring it down to something that's going to be a misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we do. We, you know, I go in, I say, okay, you know, I, I, you, you, do you really want to bring this in for a trial? You know, most criminal cases are tried in front of a jury. So you want to, you know, go through the whole process of bringing in a jury and Oh, is this person's first time being in trouble? You think the jury, you know, blah, 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 you know, come in with all kinds of different, you know, I've had situations in the past, I have tried some criminal cases uh, in the past, of one in particular, not necessarily did it reach a trial, but we were able to negotiate. Uh, I had a client, he's driving a vehicle, um, and he's driving a vehicle, they find a gun in the vehicle um, and some other items. <laughs> they were not on him, okay? And so, you know, I go, we go through a whole lot of different kinds of, you know, discovery process. So I say to the DA, okay, uh, let me have my expert to uh, examine the gun, examine these items, see if my client's fingerprint is on it then oh, all of a sudden, I've never been able to find that. It's always the case that when I would take the gun for analysis, there are no fingerprints, no fingerprints whatsoever because they wipe the gun clean. So they can, <laughs> that's what they do. And I know that for a fact. So there are no fingerprints to distinguish who actually was holding, so because my client, he's just driving the, the car, so, uh, you know, possession, what they say, possession is nine-tenths of the law. He's driving the vehicle, so everything in the vehicle is his. And so, so at the end of the day, we're able, but this guy was a career criminal, criminal so, <laughs> so he ended up having to do some time, but, you know, we get that down to something lesser uh, the, uh, on the actual uh, drug charges instead of it, you know, we break it down to something a little less than what it actually is and get the sentence down to something more manageable or instead of sending him to a real penitentiary, let him do his time in the state jail, these types of things, that's what we work on. Yes, ma'am. Did you hear about the, um, the 
the guy they just got out of jail here, he was falsely accused of murder. Yes. How do they? How do they false. make up for that? Yeah. Like. I mean, they they know? did they did I think he got a couple million dollars. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. but 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 he said obviously it does not make up for it. Right. But there there is a statute that says that if that happens, they it calculates how much the state is has to pay the person for that. He got a couple million dollars. Yeah, but I, I don't know if it was a career family. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was many 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 many, many years. I mean. Just on no evidence, but that comes down to dirty I mean, cops. Not just dirty cops, but not having good representation. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you know, because I'm going, I'm going in. If it's me, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm really. We're gonna do battle. <laughs> and so, and, and I'm gonna tell you over time. Because uh, sometimes, you know, uh, judges, they have to, they'll appoint people to represent a, a person. And over time, you know, I could see judges, they say, oh, yeah, this will be a good cat fight. They'll get, they'll see the attorney on the other side, <laughs> and they'll say, oh, let's bring in Miss Blackmore. This will be a good cat. I mean, I have really, I'm really just resting in the pasture right now because it was really, it's really hard work. You know what I'm saying? Because you really have to do battle. Because the uh -huh. prosecutor, it's like three of them. They, you know, you you have to. They have <coughs> three people <laughs> working on a case, and so if you don't have a good lawyer, yeah, you can find yourself in jail for a whole. I say jail, <laughs> incarcerated <laughs> for many, 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 many years. So it is a very serious thing. I mean, I tell people all the time, I mean, you, you know, even people for DWIs, you know, they'll pull you over on the side of the road, you know. I, you know, tell, I mean, you, the, you don't have a obligation to help the state to prove their case. If you think you're going home, don't, you just need to assume that don't, blow, don't, you know, don't give in in any kind of way. You know, now they have where they give you a blood test and all this kind of, I mean, don't submit to any of these types of things because you are incriminating your own self. Right. And so, wait. So if, you, if they do it anyway, if they do it and you don't, and you don't give your consent, like, you can. is it just like your word against theirs? <laughs> if I'm saying like no, I said I didn't. I didn't want them to do the test, yeah, and he did it anyway. Say so, no, they, 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 she absolutely gave her consent. Though they have the law now where they can take your blood, which I really think, if I get ever get one of those cases, I just, I just don't, I don't agree with that law. But there is a law now where they can, in some states, where they can take your blood. But what I would say is, if somebody's trying to get you to do a breathalyzer, you need to say. No, thank you. I want to talk to my mother. And then you need to try to get a conversation with a lawyer. They're going to, I mean, it, peop, you cannot be scared of going down there to, to the station and get, get your lawyer. Because if, because, I mean, there are all kinds of things now because they can, they can suspend your license right then and there. You know, so you need a good lawyer. I think that's what it was. Like, if you don't consent to a breathalyzer, then you automatically have a suspended license. It could be, and it's different from every state. And but so, then is that your lawyer's job to like come in there and overturn that? Sure. Absolutely. Yes. But yes, that's, okay. that's, that's how all this works. So, uh, and then uh, don't think that just because it's a business that it cannot incur criminal liability, because you will see that. It can. The business and its uh, officers can be held criminally liable for certain business uh, types of uh, activities. And so I am going to just show you a little bit of this that was in the textbook. And so these are some of the ideas that we've talked about uh, just just now. But here, 
It talks about, recall from chapter 15, corporations, of course, <coughs> and corporations exist as a separate legal person. Uh, so just remember that uh, from that from uh, chapters before. And criminal statutes have embraced the concept that a corporation may be charged with a crime along with, apart from, its principles or agents. And then Congress has specifically included business entities in criminal statutes in areas that impact businesses, including fraud, obstruction of justice, health and safety requirements, which is what we're going to talk about this evening. Um, and because of the inherent difficulties in terms of proof, most statutes do not require the specific mental intent. They do not require the specific mental intent, guilty mind, that is required for other crimes. And so then our book talks about this Park Doctrine. Uh, and so it talks about the Park Doctrine was developed by the United States Supreme Court in a famous 1975 case in which the court held that an individual corporate officer could be held guilty in this case of a misdemeanor crime under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, FDCA, for allowing food to become adulterated while stored in a corporate warehouse. Mm -hmm. And so it says, in 1970, Food, Drug, uh, the FDA observed and advised Park of unsanitary conditions, including rodent infestations at his Philadelphia warehouse. In 1971, the FDA found similar conditions at his Baltimore facility. After the violations were not corrected, the government charged ACME and Park, ACME being the business, and Park individually with a misdemeanor under the FDCA. Although ACME pled guilty, Park argued that he could not have possibly had the requisite knowledge necessary to commit the crime. A jury convicted Park eventually, and the Supreme Court affirmed the conviction. The court pointed out the narrowness of the decision, but nonetheless affirmed that corporate agents have a high level of responsibility when it comes to the well-being of the public. First of all, they noted a condition. They told him about it. He was on notice, so he knew about it. Okay, so that's the problem here. Once you know about it, then you can't come back and say, I didn't I could not have had the intent required. We're talking about food mm -hmm. that people are going to be uh, consuming. consuming, which could be very dangerous, you know, could cause someone to die. Uh, brought in federal court because there are federal, uh, those federal crimes or federal statutes that we're talking about in the Park case. Uh, they cannot be adjudicated by a state court. It has to be a federal court. And so here is our docket sheet here. So this is the, the I'm just going to look at the docket sheet first for this case. It's in Illinois in the United States District Court in the Chicago Division, and this is the LaGru case. And so this, uh, well, I'm going to bring in the uh, information about it, but these are the counts that this particular <laughs> business and its officer were charged for uh, slaughter, poultry in compliance with existing laws, aid in the bed, sale of transport, adulterated, adulterated food, and we'll talk more about how this food was adulterated. But these are some of the charges that were uh, brought against this particular person. And so it's going to start out in federal court with an indictment. And Actually, what happens is this goes to a grand jury, okay? 
And so there's usually a grand jury that's already, that, that they bring people in for a grand jury and they kind of sit on that grand jury for that particular court for a couple of months at a time. And the prosecutor will bring several cases in front of them, bring the evidence, and then uh, request an, indict, uh, an indictment on those charges. And so this is what the indictment looks like. Or some of the defendants, and it, it lists all of different counts. So, this is just a grand jury indictment, and then at the end. At the end, then it's signed by the grand jury four person and uh, the prosecutor, the United States attorney. And then it's filed with the court, and that's how the criminal case begins against that person. This is the case, and so just now, let me get through the facts. I, but this this one was in your book, so I'm sure you uh, there was an excerpt of this case in your book. But just here are some of the background facts. And so, <coughs> based on severe rodent infestation and sanitary uh, problems at a Lagru distribution systems warehouse, Lagru was convicted of 30 felony counts. The group was sentenced to a five-year term of probation. Now, these were felony counts, and he was able to get probation. Uh, ordered to pay a total of restitution of $8.2 million jointly and severally with co-defendants and sentenced with a total fine of $2 million. So jointly and severally. So now remember what I told you about what that means. So. Somebody want to give a stab at it? Okay. Um, it's like the partners in the business are equally responsible for the amount. That's right. The All the defendants. So once I get that judgment, if I can get all my money from one, I can because they're jointly and severally liable. Okay? Any one of them, if the other ones don't have any money, any one of them, I can get that money from them. And so he now appeals. Okay, so we've gone through all of those stages and he now appeals the conviction and, and the sentence. And the court is telling you right here that they really they really affirm all of it, but they affirm three, four, and five and, and the sentences for those. And they vacate and remand sentence, the sentence for count five. So that doesn't mean that he won't have to, when they said it remanded, they mean they're sending it back down to the district court for the district court to do something, uh, you know, uh, uh, adjudicate it in a different way. He still have to probably have to come up, uh, pay some type of a fine or conviction for that count as well. Uh, but for some legal reasons, they uh, vacated it and remanded for a sentence so that the, the district court can, can re-sentence uh, him on count five, or them on count five, or whoever is appealing. And so here we go with our facts. The conditions at LaBrew's coal storage warehouse in Chicago were enough to turn even the most enthusiastic <laughs> meat-loving carnivores into vegetarians. I don't know why people felt like they needed to say <laughs> that. Yes. Yeah, I don't, that was kind of, that's not, that's, that's not, that's an opinion. It's an opinion. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Right. That's an opinion. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how I feel about them, you know. But anyway, it's true. <laughs> so uh, the Pershing Road warehouse was a cold storage facility that stored raw, fresh, and frozen 
meat, poultry, and other products. He did not own any of these products, but he was in the business of storing oh. these for different businesses. You know, like a restaurant, they may not have the room to store their food, so they had it stored, and then they just go and get it, you know, what they need from this facility. And so he's keeping other people's property. They're assuming that he's keeping, that, that's what they're paying him, to keep it in a, in a, a a state that people can consume it. I mean, that's what they're paying him for. And so based on the trial testimony of LaGrue's manager, David Smith, it is clear that LaGrue was aware of the problem in 1999. In January of 1999, Smith, one of the co-defendants now, who he has already pled guilty to misdemeanor charges, uh, and so that's how the government does. They'll flip a witness so that they can testify against the other defendants. He was hired as the manager of the Pershing Road warehouse. When he started, he noticed a rodent problem at the facility. <laughs> I'm not looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically, Smith learned that LaGrue's, uh, LaGrue workers found rodent droppings and occasionally caught rats in traps throughout the warehouse. This one was in y'all's book, so I'm, uh, I, thought, I thought it was very interesting. Soon after Smith approached LaGrue, LaGrue's president, Mr. Stewart, Jack Stewart, okay, so he's another co-defendant. He's been sued in his individual capacity. He's the president of the company mm. about the rota problem at the warehouse. <coughs> Smith and Stewart discussed the rota problem. They knew about it, and they, did, they frequently discussed it. Unfortunately, it got worse. According to Smith, in 2001, the Guru employees were catching more rats and finding more rodent droppings. Smith testified in that in late 2001 or early 2002, the Guru warehouse workers regularly caught rats at least one to two rodents per day and discovered rodent rat droppings and rodent gnawed products in the warehouse. Rodent damaged products were coming from all over the warehouse, with the bulk of the damaged product coming from the basement. But they knew the problem was in the basement. Smith testified that although employees would destroy the product that had been gnawed, LaGrue did not conduct any tests to make sure that other boxes that appeared okay were not similarly contaminated by the rodents. Eventually, the rat problem came so bad that LaGrue assigned warehouse employees to rat <laughs> patrols to search for rats and rat droppings to put out traps and report that to report that to him about the number of rats they were removing from traps each day. At one point, the rat patrol, patrols tallied as many as 50 trapped rats. But we're talking about a very large warehouse because at yes. one point you could see that it was like, what do you say, like two million pounds of, yes. of meat coming out. Yes, this is a day. huge, so, yes. So the cost of having pest control there. Would be a lot of money, you think? I, I know what you're going to say, definitely less than what you had to pay, but yes. Right, but if you know you got rats, you got to do something about it. Why didn't you just move the product? Okay, well, hold on. <laughs> First, you move the product. Then move it where? Move it up. Move it out huge. of the basement. Well, oh, huge, that's enough. Yeah, okay, wait a minute. Okay, well, hold on. So, <laughs> what? Let me hold on. Let me figure out what you're telling me. Okay, let me just get this straight, because because he thought this is exactly what you thought. So maybe this is acceptable. But for me, if you got my meat over there, and you got one rat. Let me find out that you got one rat in the building. <laughs> no, not I'm done with you. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, if they, if he realized that he had a problem, right? The first thing that the manager should have done is move the product, get the rope, move, move it where? Uh, I don't move it out of the you basement. You got one rat in that whole building oh, on the first, third floor, there. on the basement, it's anywhere. It's and my, my, it's every shelf, every neighborhood. My food every. is in the building. Yeah. And you got a rat? Ate one rat. Yeah, well, yeah, I agree with you. Bye. 
Okay. But did, is he telling his clients that? Of course, of course not. not. Okay. So hold on. So, Stuart Smith met with representatives from McLeod, the group's pest control company. Uh, oh, yeah. They to discuss the rodent problem, <laughs> although McLeod recommended that the group make certain changes to the warehouse, including rodent proofing, dock doors, cementing holes and walls, and sealing sewer lids. Stewart did not give Smith authorization to implement these recommendations because he concluded the project was too go. expensive. Oh my. Here okay. we go. That's right. I wonder if these people just think that they'll never get called. Because at some point you have to think, okay, but if I do get called, that's my business. Because if I'm a restaurant right now, I'm saying, no, I ain't never taking my business back there, you know. I'm very <laughs> but there are people that work there, you would think that somebody, <clears throat> that the word would get out. But anyway, despite improvised solutions to the road problem the situation got worse. Improvised? Well, I wonder I know, what was I like improvised, the improvised there. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Cover a couple holes. Okay, so oh, for like example, example what did you do? Spam it with opening me. Oh, hold on, let's oh, see. Cool. I, I don't want to read that. Oh, you don't want to read it? No, I just already saw my line here. Oh, oh. <laughs> for example, in February, the group had particular problems with rats getting into the beef brisket. Oh. Yeah. Uh. Held in the basement. Uh, the brisket. No. <laughs> <laughs> the brisket. Uh. LeGru arranged to ship beef brisket from this warehouse to his camera facility. Ah, uh, here so, we go. Okay. You all right? Okay. <laughs> Before... <laughs> Oh, I'm so not okay. Oh, okay. Well, he did what you said. He moved it. <laughs> not in toilet. They find it. Yeah, but so I think it's had the one that went unchecked. No, I didn't. Uh, uh, well, hold on. But he moved it. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> Oh, wow. We moved into a whole different, oh, not a whole different. Well, not the whole thing, just that <coughs> beef brisket, not like oh, he moved everything. The brisket. Okay. Oh, he moved the brisket. Yeah. <laughs> not everything else, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, before LaGrue shipped the brisket, its employees expected the boxes, separated boxes that appeared to have rodent damage, and the boxes that appeared to be undamaged were returned to inventory. There we go. But wow. Really sick. Sick. Okay. Warehouse damage, such as from rocks, from boxes, or forklift damage. You know what's funny? I was in Illinois as a child from '99 to like 2002. I'm probably dead. So. <laughs> Because if you went to any restaurant and you had any brisket, you probably had some of this tasty. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, is I used to live in Chicago. <laughs> oh, you had brisket too, huh? <laughs> oh, man. And McGrew's employees started writing M.M. <laughs> short for Mickey Mouse. Oh, oh God. On oh, outgoing bills of lading to differentiate the rodent damage from other warehouse-related damage. Upon discovering that the GRU employees were using the MM notation for rodent damage, Stewart instructed them to stop doing that. And because the clients would ask, okay, what does this MM stand for? And oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Many customers did make claims for damaged product. One customer asked the GRU 
if it had a rodent problem because the customer had received rodent damage mm -hmm. from the Groove's warehouse on several occasions, specifically boxes with knob marks and holes. In response, LaGruz sent a letter explaining that there was a small area of the basement with rodent activity and that it would move the product out of the basement to be stored somewhere else in the facility. I don't think they're like, for your services, but I'm Clearly not. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they're like, that's the truth. Wait, read the next one. Read the next one. <laughs> read the next one. 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 Read the next no. You know what? I'm, let me find somebody in here to volunteer to be the owner of the group. I understand why after this. <laughs> I, I can still, usually I do this at the beginning, but let me see if I can find anybody who will volunteer to be the owner of the group. <laughs> you should have started the day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, Rhonda Dunson, a quality assurance manager for, Le, for Le new customer, Aurora Foods, she came to the warehouse to check on her products. That's what I would do. Mm -hmm. She went out there and she discovered excessive droppings. Oh. Uh-uh. Bye. What is, what is a feeding oh, area? Oh, oh, oh. That is, awesome. is that the area of sudden food on the trap or something? Like trying to put bad pieces on and just giving it to the rat. <laughs> What looked like a feeding area for rodents. Oh my god. Ceiling and wall damage exposed oh pork god. mold. Oh, oh. Pest. oh, oh my god. god. What is pest harvest? So, are, are they, they harboring the pests? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I have a question at this okay. point. <laughs> she said, I have a question at this point. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, so before Rhonda came and discovered all that mess. Uh huh. Those brisket are going into a restaurant. Yes. You're never gonna and a customer again. get really sick. Guarantee it. He is suing the owner of the restaurant, who's obviously gonna go in jail, and his restaurant is gonna close. Uh huh. He could kill now, us. Okay. So then after that, obviously, after spending, losing everything, he can go back and recuperate all his losses. With. Sorry. La Rue uh -huh. had uh -huh. a storage that was completely inappropriate, right? Uh -huh. Say that again? He would still have to what? <laughs> he could actually go back to Okay, to him but listen, there are people that get sick in restaurants all the time. You would have to, it, it would be hard to know exactly what caused the person to be sick. I mean, yes, they could say, okay, well, I have brisket, but... Dropping the rats. I, but they don't. Go the but hope, but, but what I'm telling you is that the person at the restaurant, they don't even know yeah, about this. I, I, I get you see that, what I'm saying? That, so they would never probably even click. That's too bad. Okay. That this is going because you would you uh, you would think maybe it could be from the fact that it was that the food maybe was not kept at the right temp. There are a whole lot of different things right. that could cause people to get okay. sick. You see. It's hard to draw a straight line to the reason, and the, and they would never click if they were not Rhonda, sure. and they had been out there to see these conditions. They would never even make the connection. I wonder what prompted her to come visit the area. Cause, cause that's her. Mark, see, that's no. her job. She's a quality, quality insurance, insurance manager, manager for oh, that particular. Like food company oh, that's oh, storing oh. their food there. Okay. So okay. that's her job to. Okay. Yeah, to make sure the quality of their product is up to standard. Okay. So she's going to go out there and check on, on their property. And she goes out there and this is what she finds. Okay, uh, so in her later correspondence between Stewart and Aurora, LeGru refused to pay a claim. So she made a claim and, and they, he refused to pay. He said, further, Stewart represented to Aurora Foods that the pest control company only found two totes with old mouse droppings and no other signs of infestation. And that a recent American Sanitation Institute inspection did not find any problems. 
Oh, okay. That's true. This is all this is all hearsay. <laughs> uh well, wait a minute, for the steward represented. So, I mean, this is from his testimony now. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's there. He's the upper level manager that's working in the company. The prosecutor has now gotten him to plead to a less charge to get him to testify now against him. And so I guess you could say it's hearsay. But he has firsthand knowledge. Uh, but that's a good observation. Uh, this information provided by LaGrue was not true. As the ASI representative testified at trial, mm -hmm. one of the critical issues ASI found was rodent activity. Mm -hmm. Moreover, so so this part is not mm -hmm. okay. Yes, here's saying. Moreover, a report from McLeod, who was the guy who did the pest inspection, uh, a report from McLeod. LaGrue's pest control company had previously informed LaGrue of the vast room problem. So they're setting up the facts to establish that he knew about it. Yes, ma'am. So I'm confused because if I'm the American Sanitation Institute and I go there and they have vast um, rodent problems, why are they not shut down? Why is yeah. this even a trial later on when it should have been like, oh no, this is ridiculous. This, yeah. I can't even allow this to continue happening. This is food. This isn't toys or trial? whatever the case would be like. Do so hold on. So eventually, on May 25th, 2002, Hugh McCauley, a United States Department of a USDA food safety yeah. inspector, went to the warehouse. I'm assuming that you know somebody probably prompted him to mm -hmm. do that. Okay, one of these ASI people or somebody. At that time, the grew employees were processing hams for freezing without the benefit of USDA inspection. In addition, the hams were uncovered. So I'm assuming that you must have some type of USDA inspection before you can process hams. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and then they, they were uncovered. Macaulay <coughs> notified other USDA officials, and uh, Kate Holmes, a USDA compliance official, went to the warehouse on May 29th. Holmes noticed that in the warehouse freezer, the hams were being stored. <clears throat> where the hams were being stored, the walls were deteriorating, the ceiling and structures were rusty, and the paint was sticky. Holmes detained the ham. Thank God. <laughs> but she left the brisket. <laughs> 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 On May 29, 2002, Holmes and Macaulay conducted a more detailed examination of the conditions in the Persian Road warehouse. Holmes observed holes, observed holes in the walls with glue boards, in front of them, fresh rat droppings on the floor of the food storage areas and boxes of beef product that had been gnawed by rats and was driven blood. Yeah. Holmes advised Smith that no food products would be allowed to come into or leave the basement of the warehouse. Just the basement. Just the basement. <laughs> Who are these people? <laughs> I, I wasn't raised that way. <laughs> Me neither, because I see one rat and I'm Audi. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> After the USDA inspectors left, Stewart advised Smith Stewart to advise Smith to start cleaning up the warehouse. Consistent with this discussion, Smith and approximately 20 LaGrue employees cleaned the partial road warehouse and threw out meat boxes and pallets. Oh. The following morning, 14 USDA officials <laughs> arrived at the warehouse to begin an intensive inspection. Prior to arriving at the Persian warehouse, USDA officials advised representatives from other federal, state, yeah, and local <laughs> health agencies about the conditions at the warehouse. Yeah. No, so now this is how they are able to build up the criminal charges. As a result, uh, officials from the FDA, <laughs> the Illinois Department of Public Health, the Chicago Department of Public Health, and the Illinois Department of Agriculture assisted in the inspection. When the officials arrived, they observed and photographed dumpsters and tow bins full of meat, ice, debris, pallet, and packing materials. <laughs> These findings were discussed with Smith, who acknowledged that he and other employees had been there all night cleaning the warehouse in anticipation of the inspection. 
And so the inspectors found and photographed the following positions at the Persian Royal Warehouse, uh, warehouse rat droppings and rat nestings material throughout the warehouse, including next to and on product rodent, rodent gnawed meat, poultry, and other food products, live rodent sites, <laughs> blood from meat products on the floor mixed with rodent droppings, and rat tail marks, dirt and debris on meat, potential rodent access points including open sewer drains and openings under doors, holes in ceilings, walls, and the floors, ice spilled up on the ceilings, directly above store product, and water dripping from the ceilings on the product. Mold and filth on the walls and ceilings, several inoperable bathrooms, which forced warehouse workers to use broken toilets and flush them with buckets of water and raw sewage and standing water on the floor. So this is oh, after Lord. they went and cleaned all night clean, with the 20 clean. employees. What did oh, they, they do? Clean. Just throw everything out? <laughs> Obviously not. Right, because <laughs> I'm lying. <laughs> so. Just the really, really, really bad stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you have to cook your meat very well. I think okay. everybody will think about this the next time they oh, go yeah. out for food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all are all going to think about you next no, time. No, no, no. In my English class yesterday, we had two people do a project on uh, veganism. It was like they didn't have to do the project. They asked the teacher, can we come up here and talk to everybody about veganism? So we had to watch like all around. I mean, the chickens being like a lunch. Oh, 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 my God. It was terrible. awful. Oh, well, people don't, yeah. People don't, oh. you all don't know what goes into, <coughs> to the process. Yeah, from processing the, chickens. Yeah. So no, it will turn, it will turn <laughs> your stomach. Uh, so I don't, yeah. It, it's, it's awful. <laughs> anyway, on May 30th, 2002, all 22 million pounds wow. of the meat, poultry, and food products at the warehouse were ordered detained, and the group was issued a notice of non-compliance. On May 31st, the group's Persian Road warehouse was shut down. I hope they shut down the other one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the 22 million pounds of food products stored at the warehouse were either destroyed or to me, this one got me or was subject to subjected to a strict decontamination procedure. It should have all been thrown away. Yeah, it's it's destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? And, and, and how would you destroy that? Burn it. <laughs> That's cooking it. Slip it. Slip it. Slip it. Slip it. Disgusting. Just give it to more rats. Right. They yeah. just left in the warehouse where the rats eat it. So oh, once God. they started on May 25th, oh. the process moved pretty quickly then. Oh, yeah. This is just yeah. six days after they started. Yeah, because they were like, uh uh. <laughs> it was bad. It was even after the cleaning. They cleaned. It looked bad. Like, So, what about the people who distributed the meat to the warehouse? Like, what? Can, they're out of business now too because they have nowhere to send their meat to be stored, right? Oh, I'm sure there are other people who do this. Yeah, but that's yeah. why but they were. Oh, but you're sure, right. Like, they're, yeah. They're like, what the heck? Right. So Not they're really out. Right. Yeah. So their yeah, meat is gone. Million dollars yeah. worth of meat. Yeah. And so I'm assuming that's why they tried to decontaminate some of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. Risky to save it. To save it. <laughs> well, because these people, this is their property. This is not their. He does not own it. I know. You know what I'm saying? So but these companies are relying on being able to. Doesn't he have insurance? Well, I'm Does assuming. He? Well, I'm assuming that there were people who sued him, and they oh, were able time. to get their to get whatever was yeah. left. Yeah. 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 Because I'm pretty sure they didn't want the food. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't, but... Because they're, they're like gonna, the middleman, right? Mm-hmm. It's the people they're who send the meat there. They're not the middleman. Yeah. It's just like, a storing facility. He's just storing it for, let's say, uh, Applebee's. Right. Okay? And then the, they have the, already bought this meat. Right. They don't have a place to keep it, so they're keeping it here. So right. when they need some, based on whatever they're going to be cooking for the week or whatever, maybe they have somebody to go and pick up some pieces, mm -hmm. some of it, and bring it to the store. This is their... They've already, this is their product that they've already paid for. So okay. now, once they take it, it's gone. They have to buy more. Yeah. And so, um, 
So, you know, so at the beginning of the case, it tells you that he was found guilty and what all the fines were. So now he appeals. He argues that the district judge's jury instructions improperly subjected him to strict liability for the felony offenses. What he's saying is that thing that we were talking about before, that, you know, <clears throat> that he should not be, I mean, well, I, what he's, I think what they're, what he's trying to say is, I, other people in the company did this. I did not exactly. There's no way that I can, that you can say that. <laughs> She's not buying it. That I had the, <laughs> in, the intent or the knowledge. <coughs> he did have the knowledge. <laughs> what do you mean? Fine. He didn't have the intent. Trying to be angry with everybody. I see. I know now that he had the intent or knowledge. You and I, we all know, because they would bring him. But what he's saying is that whatever they did, I guess he's saying I did not. They just did. This is what they did. I didn't. You know, I didn't know about every single thing that they did. He's trying to say he did not instruct them specifically to do some of the things the employees did. As far as I, I'm just trying to fix it, <laughs> and so he's arguing the same thing that the guy was arguing in the park situation, and so uh, what well, we have yeah. <laughs> sorry Nixon. What we have learned though is that he cannot. You're going to have a higher degree of culpability when it comes to those types of crimes because we're talking about food that people have to defend. I'm just confused as to how that's a defense. That's what Park said. I am a CEO or okay. or some highly appointed officer. This is my company. So right, he's that an problem officer. was so bad that yes. it's it's pretty much neglect. Because how did you not that means you haven't visited this warehouse in two years. In two years you haven't been here and looked around at all. If I can come in and see live rats walking around. I think that's what he that's what that's he what he's mentioned. saying. Yeah. I, I may have been negligent, but I didn't know each and everything. That's what he's trying to say. And the judge is saying, no, this is not just mere negligence. Right. Uh -huh. You knew and intended to do yeah. what you did. And too many proof. Uh -huh. And that. Because the cost was too high to put some cement right. in the hole. Yeah. Right. He had to cover some sewer. Right. He, he to knew. Take some bathrooms. <laughs> because, yeah, I am a slumlord. <laughs> and then, uh, since the group was a corporate defendant judge, the judge, I'm just going to say, also gave the jury the Seventh Circuit pattern jury instruction saying that a corporation acts only through its agent. So he's kind of saying they did it. But the judge is saying, no, 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 knowledge and intent means that, the, that when the corporation's employees act, they're acting on behalf of the company. And so whatever the employees do or, or know, the corporation is going to be held to also know and have the knowing intent. So is he saying that the jury, that the judge gave the jury like biased information, that, uh, something that would make them like sort of like sway their decision one way or the other? Not necessarily sway their decision. See, when you give the jury instructions, you give them instruction based on the law, okay? He's saying that the judge gave him the wrong law. Mm. He's saying, I'm a corporate <coughs> defendant, so I am i don't do everything. I'm, a off, I'm an officer. I don't do all of these little things that, remember when we had the Chipotle case and I was telling y'all, mm -hmm. you know, somebody knew, you know, this, but, you know, so corporations will try to act like they don't know because they're up sure. You know, somewhere so, else, um, you have people I'm that the office there in the right, warehouse. Right. So you can't say that I knew or had the intent to do this because I didn't know. That's really what he's saying. He's saying the judge should have given them a uh, instruction. Uh, let me see. Finally, the judge instructed the jury on a legal definition of adulterating the blah, blah, blah. The groom. So he offered his own jury instruction based on a different law. That's what he wanted the judge to give to the jury. <coughs> 
And the judge said that that particular jury instruction that he wanted to use was not on point with this particular case. Uh, he rejected his instruction because the defendant in that case was convicted of the sale of adulterated beef products, which was different than what this case proved. It says, the crimes charged in counts three, four, and five require proof of intent before the defendant can be convicted. To establish intent, the government must prove that the defendant knowingly did an act which the law forbids. I don't see why he can't see that that's what he did because he was there making, he, he met with the, go ahead. Smith. He yeah. met with Smith. Not Smith just Smith. Told him. Not just Smith, but he met with the pest control people. Yeah, and the pest control people. Mm -hmm. no, and, and he and decided person. not and to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Therefore, mm -hmm. he yeah. acted. He did yes. criminal yes. intent. Felony. But he's trying to establish that he's a corporate defendant and that he didn't have the specific knowledge. And so that's... So that's, he's lying through his teeth. That's, that's what he's doing. <laughs> The instructions in this case explain that in order to convict Lagoo, the jury had to find that an authorized agent or employee of Lagoo normally stored products under insanitary conditions, which is what he did. Since 1999, this is what a court is coming in now, and they are doing the analysis and saying he knew. He knew since 1999 when he had the uh, conversation with his manager, uh, and several employees were aware of the insanitary conditions at the warehouse, the group was aware of the rodent infestation from the formal report, such as the ASI report and from the pest control guy. So, see, if they were not able to establish how much he knew <coughs> about it, like in the park case, they he was like, but I didn't, you know, how was I to know? They were able to establish that he, that we already told you about this, you know, you can't say you don't know. He knew. And this is how they were able to get him because he himself, he's not at the corporate, you know, in the corporate office and he met with these people personally. So that's where he's found a crucial charge in these three offenses that LaGrew knowingly stored these products under insanitary conditions with states, which states the men's rare, remember, from our textbook for the charges, the guilty mind, the mental requirement. And so LaGrew's argument that the prosecutor's passing claim during rebutted turned the case into a strict liability prosecution, I understand why he, he's thinking that, uh, but the fact of the matter is it is strict liability because we're talking about food. I was thinking about Arthur what? Anderson when you were talking about all of them like putting all the stuff in the tow bins. I started thinking about Arthur Anderson and the thousand uh, tons of like paper that they like threw away the day oh, like, yeah. I the day oh, of yeah. the SEC was coming along. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so see, yeah, yeah so they cite that. that. <laughs> Actually, so they got off later, but they got off eventually. Eventually, yeah, because. And so then, so and so, yeah. if that's the case, then that is why he, he's arguing that case. See, he brings his case to court with him, and the court says, "That's no, a completely you. different case." I mean, like I, I make the connection, but it's completely it, different. It case. is. A, it is a connection. Well, well, because Arthur Anderson was the accounting company for Enron, but he isn't the he isn't the company for somebody right, else. But it's kind of so obvious from here yeah, that's been. Yeah, he's just saying he's just going for more support for his contention, his con his contention that a different jury instruction should have been used, other than the one that the judge used. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm saying the judge used, but that's the one that was would have been given to the judge by the prosecution. So then, yeah. uh, here Lagrue was charged with knowingly storing meat, poultry, and food products in insanitary conditions. In this case, the government needed to prove that agents, this is all they needed to prove, that agents of the corporation normally stored meat. That's his problem. He's saying, I didn't know. They knew because they did it. 
the, the court is saying all that is needed to prove is that the agents knew. That's where the park doctrine comes from. All you need to prove is that the agents, the people who work at the company knew, then that's enough to assert liability on uh, the corporation and the corporate officers. Okay? So that is something that is very important to keep in mind because, and I see that people don't keep that in mind when I go around to different businesses. You know, they let their employees do things and they'll just ruin the business. But what people need to know is that in certain instances, you can be held liable for what that employee is doing. Mm -hmm. Even if you really, really, really don't know, all the government has to prove is that the agent knew. Mm -hmm. And that makes the critical difference here. That's like holding the parent responsible for what the kid does. Yeah. So did they take away his um, his probation? Is that what they, they uh, was that what he got for the count five? What? He got he got probation. Let me see here. This is the amended judgment. Okay, so let me see if I can find him. So, I'm assuming that he got uh, probation for all of the counts. Oh my God. That's crazy. In addition to the fines. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, what did he get? Community service? Wait, what do you mean community service? Yeah, <laughs> no, that's just kidding. Well, if you. <laughs> <laughs> Like in addition you know, to the probation. They say probation, you know, you gotta serve your time doing community service or something to that effect. Okay. So if you get community service, that is gonna be that's what's gonna be stated. Now, once you get probation, uh, you have to actually that has to actually be one of the things that you're given. So once you get probation, the probation officer can't say, okay. Go do community service. The judge has to specifically assign community ass service. Yes. Yes. So he just gets probation and walks free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, why do you say walk free? I'm sorry. Three million dollars in fines. Look at all those lawyers he has. Hey, probation sucks, right? Why? <laughs> <do you> <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> it's like why do you? Doing, why do you say he walked free? He got probation. <laughs> this yeah. went. Uh, he this still was able to walk out after doing all of that damage. To how many businesses? Mm -hmm. and and just people's lives, potentially people's lives, right. and the employees, whatever and his company that now have to go find new jobs, the other crappy warehouses, like other <laughs> crappy warehouses. Okay, well then, then, then you'll be you're ready for this question. Okay, let me see. <laughs> I think we all have some strong opinions. <laughs> Well, what I find about you all, you always want to send everybody to jail, so. <laughs> no, just the guilty ones. Just the real guilty ones, you know? Like, you don't give us no, like, like the Martha Stewart case, I wouldn't have really cared if she went no, to jail. No, yeah. I was, was like, inside of trade. Example, right. Yeah. But, like, the baby case and things like that. Yeah, even if there was a kid in my books, dead. <laughs> jail. Oh, my God. Yes. I'm sorry. We know. You kill a kid, you're done. Oh my god, I went into it. It says there's a short uh, 31 question it's a quiz. quiz. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But Oof. will it change once you get it? Yes, that will change. So no, that's not your quiz. I'm sorry, but my password's not working. <laughs> oh no, I don't want to do that. 
Okay, so no, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm not going to do this. Because, see, I can only do one thing at a time on that. That's the only problem with that. So, but hold on, I'm going to give you a question anyway. So we need you to log out? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, because I don't want to mess up that. That's going on right now. Tell them the one of 31. So we can do that now? No, you can't because yours is not 31. Yours is more. Oh. 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 Less. Same amount. Okay, so more like how what 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 else would you put up for like a week? So Maybe you saying they should put him down there in the basement? For a week? That's enough? At least, yeah. Oof. I gotta bring back the electric chair. <laughs> <laughs>